Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Daniel de Almeida Braga and I'm about to present a joint work between Pierre Alain Fouque, Mohamed Sapt and me from the MSEC team at Iris Aren in France. So this work targets SCP-10, which is a secure communication protocol designed for smart cards by global platform. So in this presentation, I will start by giving a little bit of context on the smart card world and uh, present the protocol we studied, at least the relevant part for this talk. Then we will discuss all uh, the flaws we discovered and their impact on the protocol security. Since the attacks themselves are not new, I will not dive into the details here, but feel free to ask me later if you're interested or to take, a look at, uh, to take a look at our paper. I will end up with a few words on a secure implementation implementing all mitigation we suggested, so we did it to, to estimate the overhead induced by those mitigation. Smart cards are little electronic devices which look like a little yellow chip with a very low computational power, but which can ensure a very wide variety of applications and are used basically everywhere. So they are used, uh, for instance, in the electronic ID card, in banking card, in the mobile phone, in with the well-known SIM card, and in a lot more uh, field. So from this massive usage arise a real need to make interoperable deployment and management of application easier, regardless of the card manufacturer. And that's where Global Platform steps up as a consortium of uh, multiple companies trying to define some standard specification. Namely, they define how the card will communicate with each other, so they define the communication protocol to be used. In this communication, smart card will always act like a server, so they can only process requests and respond to this request with what's called an APDU, which stands for Application Protocol Data Unit, and they will inter interact with what we will call in the rest of this presentation an off-card entity through a reader, which can be either a standalone reader, in this case the reader itself is the off-card entity, or which can act as a proxy receiving command from an external server. In this case, the server will be the off-card entity. So all communication go through a secure channel defined by the secure communication protocol. The goal of such a protocol is obviously to establish a secure uh, communication session between a card and an off-card entity by starting with a key exchange step in order to, to ensure that some uh, secure cryptographic key material is shared by both the server and the card, which is then used to ensure security in the following communication. So there are various versions of uh, such protocol. For instance, we can, uh, we can mention SCP-1, 2, and 3. Only 3 is not deprecated today, but all these three versions are strongly based on symmetric cryptography, meaning that pre-shared key need to be manually deployed on the smart card beforehand and all the security uh, of the of the protocol relies on symmetric cryptography. SCP-10 has the particularity to rely on the public key infrastructure, meaning that both the card and the off-card entity will have a key pair with a public key and a private key, and they will use each other's public key during the key exchange step in order to uh, encrypt and verify some messages. So in this presentation, we'll focus on the key exchange part of the protocol and not the communication, because the communication part is basically the same between SCP-10 and SCP-3, and SCP-3 already received a quite a strong security review from academics. So key exchange can be declined in two modes, key transport mode and key agreements mode. Let's focus on the first one for now. So the off-card entity will start by sending two uh, APDU to the smart card, which are, which are basically setting management APDU. The first one is to select the applet uh, responsible from SCP-10, and the second is used to set some uh, security parameters, namely the key exchange mode to be used for the key exchange. Following these settings APDU, there is a somewhat classical certificate exchange with a certificate verification from both parts. And then comes the interesting part of the key transport mode, the Perform Security Operation Decryption APDU. For this APDU, the off-card entity will start by generating uh, the session keys to be used 
for the following communication and encrypt them with the card public key before sending it in the PDU. And only after sending these raw session keys, the off-card entity will authenticate itself to the card by signing a challenge provided by the card. At the end, uh, an optional internal authentication uh, is possible but only optional and can be skipped to avoid some heavy computation from the card. Key, transport, uh, key agreements mode follows a quite similar workflow, but mutual authentication is uh, mandatory here since the key material is exchanged along the way by both parts this time, and the session keys are derived only after the mutual authentication. In this key exchange mode, uh, the perform security operation uh, APDU becomes useless since we do not exchange raw session keys, so there is no need to perform this operation. So it's quite obvious that key agreements provide stronger security guarantees than key transport. However, in a, such a constraint environment, performance is a big deal and key transport require way less computational power. So what we did was to take a look at the specification describing this protocol and try to identify some flaws and some blur. Namely, we focused on the RSA encryption in key transport since it's used to protect very sensitive data. We are talking about the raw session keys to be used. And with what, with what we are to be some very reasonable assumption, we are able to mount two different and independent attacks allowing a full session key recovery. The first attack took only a, a few milliseconds, while the second is quite longer, it takes a little bit more than two and a half hours. However, with the second attack, we were able to, to combine it with an additional design flow in the specification to produce some valid certificate forgery signed by the card, allowing to impersonate the card in all future sessions. To test our attack, we had to implement uh, uh, our own version of SCP-10 as an applet to deploy on the card because we didn't manage to find any open source and public implementation of this protocol. And finally, we implemented all mitigation we suggested to patch these flows in order to estimate the overhead of, uh, of these mitigations. So as, uh, as I said, we didn't attack any real cards because we didn't manage to find any card implementing implementing this uh, this protocol. But we have strong evidence suggesting that SCP-10 is uh, in use uh, as we speak. First, there are some patents issued uh, recently by some Chinese banking companies. And when we talk about the Global Platform Committee, they told us they couldn't uh, deprecate SCP-10 because it was in use. And as I said, we didn't try to, to identify weakness in the symmetric encryption part used during the communication because it is the same uh, as SCP-3, so it will only be uh, redundant work. So a few words about our threat model. We put our attacker in a classical man-in-the-middle position, meaning the attackers are able to initiate a session with SCP-10, with the card using SCP-10, as anybody could do without any guarantee of success. And they are able to intercept, read, and modify any messages exchanged between an off-card entity and the smart card. From this uh, last capability, the attacker can also measure the time needed by the card to process an APDU, so to perform some specific operation simply by looking at when the card receives the APDU and when it emits a response to this APDU. However, the attacker are not able to perform any physical operation of the card, so we exclude any physical side channel leak like power consumption attack, and we exclude any fault, uh, fault attack. And of course, the attacker are not able to break the cryptographic primitives used by the smart card and the off-card entity. So after this long introduction, let's, uh, let's start with the first issue we, we noticed. SCP-10 specification specifically mandates to use a deterministic padding for RSA encryption in key transports. So if you remember, uh, the perform security operation APDU is very, very sensitive since, since it's used to transport the raw session keys to be used for the communication part. So the message to be encrypted will look like this. 
there is a three byte of parameters followed by one or more CRT. The CRT is a control reference template, which is basically a data structure containing a key along with some parameter describing its usage. And if the key is to be used for integrity purposes, an IV is added at the end. And the padding described in the specification looks like this. And as you can see, instead of a random byte string as used in the classical PKCS1 version 1.5 padding for encryption, we have a fixed byte string with only SF bytes. So this only leaves very few unknown bytes compared to the uh, modulus size. So this leads us back to 1997 with the Copper Smith attack, which allows an attacker to recover the message if the unknown part is small enough compared to the exponent. Namely, if the unknown part is less or equal to n to the power 1 over e, we are able to recover the whole message, with n and e being the public key used to encrypt the data. Now, assume uh, that the smart card is using a 1024 bits modulus, as mandated by the specification, and a small public exponent, let's say e equals 3. So e equals 3 is not a common value in servers, but in such uh, constrained devices, we, uh, it's not rare to see uh, this uh, kind of value used in order to optimize some heavy computation. And indeed, there are even some guidelines specifically designed to smart cards, which allow to use e equals 3 for optimization purposes if there are less than three entities involved. So here we only have two entities involved, so it's fair to assume that this kind of value could be used. And with this assumption, we end up with a bound allowing us to recover the message if there is up to 42 bytes of unknown data. This bound of 42 bytes is quite hard to meet in practice because the computation becomes really heavy as we approach this bound. However, an encryption key or an integrity key yield at most 34 unknown bytes, which lead to a practical attack, which take on average 0.3 seconds. This means that the attacker will be able to recover the session key before the smart card is able to decrypt it. It will take more time for the smart card to decrypt the APDU than the attacker will need to uh, recover the unknown part. And uh, what's nice with this attack is that it's only a passive man-in-the-middle attack. The attacker only needs to intercept the off-card the off entity APDU and all computation are performed offline. There is no need to contact the card at any time. Of course, it only works uh, in key transfer mode, since in key agreement we do not transmit raw session keys and we do not use such a weak padding. So two mitigation are possible for, for this attack. First, we can mandate a sufficiently big ex public exponent, but a better mitigation would be to use some randomness in the padding as it should be done. However, we need to be careful and uh, not simply increase the RSA modulus size since it will only make the attack easier. It will increase the bound on the unknown part of the message we are able to recover. And we also need to be careful as and uh, how we add randomness to the padding because simply switching to a, a classical PKCS1 version 1.5 padding may not be a valid solution. Indeed, this kind of padding is very well known to be subject to, to attack, to very well known Blechenbacher padding oracle attack, which in success would allow an attacker to perform a modular exponentiation using the victim private key on a, a, an arbitrary string of byte, meaning an attacker will be able to either decrypt the message or to forge a signature. And all an attacker needs to, to perform this attack is to be able to distinguish if some data have a specific format once decrypted. So here, uh, the perform security uh, APDU is also a very good candidate because there is no prior authentication to reach this step of the protocol. An attacker can simply send the setting management APDU to the smart card and then replay a valid certificate to reach this step of the protocol. And if we take a look at what's performed by the card on reception of this APDU, we can see that the card will perform three steps. First, 
it will decrypt the payload embedded in the APDU. Then it will verify the padding, and only after this it will try to parse the data and process it. So by, for instance, saving the session keys. Here, the specification mandates to return a unique error code if uh, some error occurs in one of these three steps. So that's good, but there is no mention whatsoever of constant time implementation. And past attack uh, have shown us that uh, handling this kind of padding securely is quite hard and it is very subject to side channel attack, like a timing attack. And if we had some TLV parsing on top of the padding verification, it becomes very, very unlikely that a common developer would implement Lee securely without a proper guidance. So this makes us believe that a developer will likely introduce some time unique at this point. In order to demonstrate our assumption, we implemented it quite naively by simply surrounding this three step in the try catch clauses and returning a unique error code in case of error, so by processing a compliant implementation. And we ended up with this, uh, this result. So this graph represents the average processing time of this APDU by the card. The red curve represents the average processing time of this APDU in case of invalid padding, while the blue curve represents the average processing time with valid padding but an error during the CRT parsing. So with some well-chosen threshold and uh, a little bit of a basic statistical test, we are able to reliably distinguish if some APDU belongs to the to the red distribution or the blue distribution, and we are able to guess the padding validity of an, of an arbitrary uh, data stream. So this means we are able to perform the Blechenbacher Oracle attack with on average 28,000 queries. So it's a little bit more than the state of the art optimization, but you know, we needed to repeat some measurements in order to be sure of our, uh, of our choice because uh, false positive have some very bad consequences in this, in this kind of attack. Obviously, two and a half hour is a little bit too much to be considered an on-the-fly attack, but the attack can be split across multiple sessions and uh, allow to allow an attacker to collect the messages, perform the attack over a long period of time across uh, multiple sessions, and recover the session key and decrypt all messages after all. A simple mitigation would be to switch to a better uh, RSA padding, such as OAEP, which is quite widely implemented in smart cards uh, nowadays. So this attack may seem a little bit useless since we already can achieve the same result in less than a second with the first attack. However, if we combine it with a design flow which is implementation dependent, which is very inherent to the specification, we end up with a very much uh, satisfying result. Indeed, uh, the same RSA key is used for basically everything. It will be used for both key transport and key agreement, but also to ensure confidentiality and authentication. And this is a very big problem. We, we imagine that this is done to save up on storage and overall complexity, but the, the, it came at a huge security cost, because the attack we describe targeting key transport and a specific decryption operation during the key transport can be propagated to the authentication to forge, for instance, a signature and, for instance, to forge a valid certificate issued by the card. So with a valid certification chain going up to the certification authority. So this will allow card impersonation in all future sessions. And if we imagine uh, that the certification authority is shared between multiple cards, for instance, if all cards issued by the same card manufacturer shared uh, common certification authority, this will allow uh, an impersonation on a very large scale. So forging a signature is a little bit harder than simply decrypting a message since there is a previous uh, step at the beginning of the attack, but it took on average seven hours to forge a valid certificate, which can also be split across multiple sessions. And considering the outcome of the attack, it becomes much more interesting. 
of course, uh, the mitigation would be to isolate key usage, at least between confidentiality and authentication. So as I said, we implemented all mitigation we suggested, and at the end, only the key isolation part um, yield a very significant overhead. We can deny it, and it's, it was expected because uh, instead of only one um, instead of only one key to transmit, one certificate to transmit at the beginning of the session, there is two certificates to transmit from each part with two signatures to verify, and it's quite heavy operation for a smart card. But this operation only needs to be performed at the first communication, since after a successful key establishment, the smart card and the other entity will save the certificate and consider it as verified, so the certificate will not need to be transmitted again on the following session. So it's really a one-time overhead. To sum up, we try to apply a very well-known attack to the smart card world where uh, public infrastructure is still quite unusual. And what with what we believe to be some quite reasonable assumption given past attack, we found two practical attack allowing a full session key recovery and uh, a certificate forgery attack allowing to impersonate smart card on a large scale. We suggest some quite simple mitigation which are easy to add to the specification and which come with a reasonable overhead once we are past the first, uh, the first session establishment. We discussed all of this with Global Platform and uh, support them during the update process of the specification. They recently released an amendment to the specification, which is still a work in progress. Some issues have, are being fixed, but other remains. But it's quite a long process to, to patch uh, such a huge, huge specification with uh, international entity involved. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me or any of the author of the paper. We will be glad to answer them.